This is CBC Vancouver News. Gunshots and a car crash send crowds running in the heart of downtown Vancouver. Bullet holes now left in a cafe window and no suspects arrested. Plus, Access and uh, availability to, to the land is important to us. If we lost even 10 feet of the parking lot to, to the road, we would lose a lot of our business. Surrey pushes ahead with plans to extend 72nd Ave, but not without pushback from local farmers and businesses. Also, when we launched, there was nothing on market. There was no um, physical stores to go get non-alcoholic. That's part of the growing movement, is just that awareness of how it's affecting us. A surge in business for booze-free beverages. We check out a few non-alcoholic shops popping up on Commercial Drive. Hello, I'm Tanya Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. We begin with a shooting in one of the busiest areas of downtown Vancouver in the middle of the day. In this video, you can see police arriving at the scene. The alley they're cautiously approaching beside the entrance to the Hilton Hotel is where the shooting happened. Police say multiple witnesses began calling 911 around 5.30 this evening. Witnesses at the scene told CBC News shots were fired and then a black SUV and a white SUV collided. Bullet holes could be seen in the rear passenger side door of the black SUV and also in the window of a nearby Tim Hortons. Officers had Robson Street between Richards and Homer blocked off for several hours. They're calling this a targeted shooting. No arrests have been made. Investigators say they'll be working through the night to collect more evidence. And meanwhile, a police scene tied up a section of East Vancouver for much of the morning. Northbound traffic on Victoria Drive north of Kingsway was blocked for several hours early today. The forensic identification unit has been on scene with a white tent behind yellow tape. Vancouver police will only say they are in the early stages of an investigation and will provide an update as soon as possible. To the Okanagan now and in Kelowna, two people have been found dead following gunshots and a fire at a local business earlier this week. The bodies were discovered Wednesday on Adams Road off Highway 97. RCMP only confirmed details today. Officers believe this was an isolated case and say the public is not at risk. Well, tens of thousands of Palestinian flags have gone up in Vancouver's West End. It's to honor the lives lost in the Israel-Hamas war. People are stopping by, they're taking pictures, they're commenting about how the impact and seeing all this many flags, it really puts into perspective the number of people who've been killed and who've been martyred since this began. 40,000 flags representing each person killed in Gaza have been spread across Devonian Park. Organizers say it took hundreds of people thousands of hours to hand make and plant each flag. They say the display is also meant to highlight what they call Canada's complicity in the conflict. This installation mirrors others around the world, including in Portland and in London. Well, Surrey is moving ahead with a proposal that would see eastbound 72nd Avenue extended from 152nd to Highway 15. The city says it's bracing for significant population growth and increased traffic in the years to come. But as Janella Hamilton reports, the project is stirring up concern among the local farming community and some businesses in the area. This stretch of agricultural land could one day be paved over to make way for Surrey's proposed 72nd Avenue extension. Land Brian Livingston's family has been farming on for more than a century. Access and uh, availability to, to the land is important to us. He says building a major road here will create logistical challenges for farmers having to move equipment like tractors and wagons. We'd have to wait for traffic, we'd have to cross traffic. It's always a problem with tractors to having cars understand that they're they're big and hard to move around and they move slower. City Councillor Mike Bowes, who is also a farmer, admits the four kilometer road extension would account for the loss of about 40 acres of productive land. But he says the infrastructure is necessary with up to 1,500 people moving to Surrey every month. As we know, traffic is, is getting worse. The city is growing. So 
there is a community need for that east-west connection. The owner of Hunter's Garden Centre on 72nd Avenue says the new road could bring in more business, but he also fears it could drive away existing customers. We have a small parking lot here and we're very busy in the spring season. And if we lost even 10 feet of the parking lot to, to the road, we would lose a lot of our business. The design and the cost of the road hasn't been decided, but according to the city's website, there are four options ranging from $95 million to roughly $160 million. I question the need for it. Uh, we just lost a lot of land for um, SkyTrain, and the whole purpose of SkyTrain is to reduce uh, uh, traffic, and yet they're, they're now proposing a, a big road as well. And, um, yeah, the... The impact of, of both is very hard on agriculture. If anything, there needs to be some, some mitigation now, right? Um, this, it, it has to be built properly, for one. Uh, keeping the farmer in mind, whether it's traffic controls, signage, um, access, like strictly for farm equipment. Now that the project has been approved by City Council, the next step is tendering design proposals and conducting public consultations. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Surrey. On Vancouver's downtown east side, a community has come together over a meal this weekend. Some of the volunteers uh, say they were once in need of help that they're now providing today. Well, it's community now, uh, where it's addiction wasn't community, it's isolation. It's a festive season, uh, it keeps me busy, it keeps me uh, uh, clean and sober, and I think it's great helping the uh, uh, community. Nearly 3,000 people turned out for the Union Gospel Mission's 34th annual Easter meal. Staff whipped up 1,700 pounds of ham, 700 pounds of scallop potatoes, and 500 pies. Many shared their own stories of hope and resilience in the face of poverty, homelessness, or addiction. Well, abandoned bunnies are making homes in the suburbs, the beaches, even at the airport. As the CDC's Georgie Smythe tells us, the problem isn't just at Easter, of course. It's existed for years, but it is getting worse. In this case, it seems the difference between a pet and a pest is time. At some point, rabbits were left here. And bunny math means with time, one plus one can equal hundreds. The odd rabbit here and there takes a while, but when you're abandoning a lot in one place, you can have an explosive colony pretty quickly. These are all rabbit homes here. For years, the city has discouraged people from feeding and abandoning rabbits in Vancouver's parks, but its animal shelters are overrun and no longer accepting surrenders. Advocates say some feel it's more humane to let them go in places like this than have them euthanized. Now they're expecting a springtime bunny boom. It's sad, um, like they are domestic rabbits, so ultimately they don't belong outdoors. Oh my God, it's lunchtime. Some are rescued and end up in outreach places like this bunny cafe, where people pay to feed, cuddle and maybe adopt. I think my bunny would like a friend, but I have it in my room, so I don't really want two bunnies in my room. But they can't be rehomed fast enough, and the supply of bunnies in the great outdoors just keeps coming. We can all see that the existing patchwork of municipal approaches is not working to curb this problem. Often provinces regulate the breeding of dogs, for instance, for very good reason. But we also need to start to regulate the breeding of rabbits as well as the sale of rabbits. Sterilization is also one way to fix this rabbit growth, but it needs buy-in fast. Without intervention, the problem will just keep multiplying. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, crowds of selfie takers have been out in full force this weekend, capturing the fluffy pink cherry blossoms that have blossomed all over the city. Families and photographers armed with selfie sticks descended on downtown Vancouver in celebration. We're trying to get a lot of pictures, yeah. but I don't know how many got so far, but we got a lot. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. The band is amazing, and uh, yeah, the flowers are gorgeous. The beauty of it and the crowd around, and it's just so lovely. The public was invited to bring picnics and enjoy the free live music performances while sitting under the 100-plus cherry blossom trees in David Lamb Park. 
The celebration known in Japan as Hanami literally translates to flower viewing and is an acknowledgement of the transient beauty of the blossoms. Well, Vancouver is hosting a premium e-gaming event this long weekend featuring some of the best players in the world. Our Saurabh Sandhu caught up with some of the contestants and the organizers who say Vancouver's gaming scene remains strong. <laughs> The pressure is on and the stakes are high. Even a momentary lapse in judgment can lead to a colossal loss. And the best in business are ready to show off their skills. Yeah, I mean, just the experience. You can hear the crowd in the background, right? I think it's just a, a live electric feel that you get when you come to an event like this. Battle of BC6, a tournament featuring top combat players from around the world, is on in Vancouver. For Melee, nine of the best ten players in the world pretty much are here, and uh, that's really good attendance. Among the contestants is Michael Kim, Canada's top-ranked Super Smash Brothers game player. BC is one of the, one of the best uh, major video game tournaments for Smash. Uh, always super high quality. There are lots of Japanese international talent is here, people from Europe, all over the world. This is the sixth edition of the event put on by local gaming company Galliant Games. This is our largest iteration yet. We have about 2,500 attendees this weekend. Our average attendee is about 25 years old this year, 18 to 30 year old, generally males, but we are trying to promote an inclusive, diverse audience as well. The event is also attracting exhibitors from all over North America, ranging from control modders to artists showcasing their artwork. Organizers say the tournament is an attempt to bring together the local gaming community. The fact that the city of Vancouver is actually supporting and sponsoring this event is a really, really big deal. Uh, I think that there's very few cities in either Canada or America in general that are willing to do that. What's at the core of gaming? What's at the core of esports? It's bringing people together. It's having these experiences. It's making these memories. And so things like this actually are helping strengthen the community and strengthen gaming and strengthen the future of esports. For those unable to attend the Battle of PC6, it's also being broadcasted on Twitch and YouTube channels. The tournament wraps up on Sunday. So Rob Sandhu, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, Brewery Row has entrenched itself in the Lower Mainland, but now a new non-alcoholic neighborhood appears to be taking shape. We caught up with a few of the shops popping up on Vancouver's commercial drive, hoping to steer people's palates towards less booze-centric drinks. Check it out. One of the few things that made me think I can quit alcohol really easily um, because the quality has changed so dramatically is the Audbert Blanc de Blanc. My name is Doug Stephen. I'm one of the owners of the Drive Canteen located at Commercial Drive in the heart of Vancouver's Little Italy. And this is our ode to convenience store culture with a massive side of non-alcoholic selection. Okay, yeah, I'd love to try it. Thank you. We opened November of 2021. When we launched, there was nothing on market. There was no um, physical stores to go get non-alcoholic. I'd have to go over here for this and over there for that. When my partner was pregnant with our son, had I grown up in a different time when there was all these great options my relationship with alcohol may have been different but uh, inevitably it was a harmful one and I'm really happy with where I'm at now uh, three years sober that was one of the first things where I was just like this is exactly like what I okay. drank back in the day um, although we have a huge amount of the people who come through our doors who are a part of the sober community we also have people who have uh, a much healthier relationship with alcohol than I do who just want to kind of fold something in just to keep it very tame and to try to match those Health Canada guidelines. Canadians drink quite a lot, um, or around twice as much as, as the average person on in the world. So that kind of like pegs our relationship, if you will, as a Canadian society with alcohol. In January of 2023, Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction came out with what's called Canada's Guidance on Alcohol and Health. So the main recommendation was Canadians should or could consider reducing their alcohol use. And then it put out different risk zones that people would fall in based on how many drinks they have. We all know that alcohol is like basically essentially poison in our bodies, right? And I think that that's part of the growing movement is just that awareness of how it's affecting us, not just physically, but our mental health and our emotional health. I 
want to welcome you to Mocktails. It's the first exclusively non-alcoholic liquor store here in Vancouver, BC. We opened on March 15th. The feedback has been incredible. It's been non-stop busy. They're driving in from Richmond and they're driving in from Tawasin and someone came from the island, like Nanaimo, like people are excited. My relationship with alcohol had to change. Um, and when I realized that I needed to change and I wanted to change after many times of attempting to make that change, I literally just woke up one day and I was like, I'm done. And that's what got me. And it, like within a couple of days, I was looking into these products and talking to other people that might have a troubled relationship with drinking as well and asking them like, would you want something like this? And everyone was like, Excited. Even they're non fruited. Oh, yeah, you like that one. Yeah. When I look at Commercial Drive, there's such a great group of people in the neighborhood who are really interested in this. Uh, and more importantly, we think that if we can establish this area as your non-alcoholic destination, whether it's going to mocktails, coming to us, um, I think that it's only going to kind of emphasize that this is a really great neighborhood to go and, and see what's out there and what can be done. Well, one man's trash is another man's treasure. That's the inspiration this International Zero Waste Day. It's motivated one environmental scientist who works in landfills to see what she could turn her plastic waste into. But I loved, like, I loved waste and recycling. I, I went back to tech school. I wanted to be, like, a garbage queen is what I told my friends in tech school. And they're like, okay, we had different summers. She works out of her basement, and so far she's made ski scrapers for removing wax and ice from skis, as well as earrings, wall hooks, and a dough scraper for making sourdough, all using a paper shredder to shred the plastic and a pizza oven to melt it all down. And business owners are also looking to go waste-free when it comes to food. Instead of throwing away unwanted produce, Heppel Family Farms in Surrey hosts Ugly Potato Days. They offer all of their produce that's deemed unsuitable by the grocery stores to the public instead, and it's free. We do Ugly Potato Day because we want to eliminate on-farm food waste and help our communities that are hurting now more than ever. They say with hundreds of thousands of British Columbians using a food bank every month, there was a great need to reduce food waste. This year's Ugly Potato event has attracted upwards of 3,000 people, and they plan to host more of them through the summer. After the break, Ottawa's promise of free contraceptives will be part of the upcoming budget and all part of the National Pharmacare Plan. We'll have those details next.
Welcome back. Let's take you overseas. And Egyptian media say Gaza truce talks will resume tomorrow in Cairo. A suspension in Israeli strikes in return for hostages remains the goal. The CDC's Chris Reyes has the latest. In Gaza, the scene of gunfire shows the dangers of delivering aid to a population on the brink of famine. According to witnesses, some were shots when Palestinians fired into the air, while others say the shots came from Israeli forces. The Palestine Red Crescent said five people were killed, three by gunfire, while others were hit by moving trucks as they tried to get food, injuring dozens more. Israeli forces have not commented on what happened, but at Al-Shifa Hospital, Israeli officials say their offensive continues, claiming Hamas is still using it as a base. All of our colleagues. From humanitarian workers, a plea to get civilians out. The patients who ha uh, and the internally displaced who had sought refuge inside the hospital are also trapped without water, without food. And there is a dire need to evacuate them. Meanwhile, in Israel, hundreds of Israeli Arabs gathered to mark Land Day. They're marking the deadly day in 1976 when Israeli forces confiscated Palestinian land, killing six unarmed Palestinians and injuring more than 100 during protests. Kamal Khatib is the deputy head of the Islamic movement in Israel. He said the land to us is father, mother and religion. It is a past, present and the future. Another demonstrator, Mahdi Abed, said, We are here to commemorate Land Day, which we cherish, and to remember our martyrs, our land, our homeland, and the right that we will never give up. In Egypt, diplomatic talks continue to end the conflict, with leaders meeting in Cairo. Jordanian Foreign Minister Ayman Safadi said, all the countries in the international community bear the responsibility for these events, for the humanitarian situation. In Gaza, more than a million Palestinians have been displaced by the current conflict. UN officials say famine in the enclave is imminent. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Well, back in our country, new details today about the rollout of a national universal pharmacare program. As the CBC's Edel Musa explains, it'll start with greater access to birth control and diabetes medication. In the upcoming federal budget, we will be delivering free contraceptives. Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland says the federal government's universal pharmacare plan will give more than 9 million Canadian women much needed access to contraceptives and greater control over their bodies. This expert agrees. Access to contraception is not only a reproductive right, but also a fundamental aspect of public health and equity. The cost of contraception should never be a factor in decision making. A range of diabetes medications will also be made more affordable. We're going to go step by step. We've decided to start with contraceptives and diabetes medicine because we think those are great places to support women, support young women, support them to have real control over their lives and their bodies. And because we know that diabetes is a condition that really afflicts a lot of Canadians. Freeland says the federal government will work with provinces and territories to increase spending on public drug benefit programs to provide universal, single-payer coverage for these medications. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. You're looking at a live shot of BC Place. I'll have your full Easter long weekend forecast coming up next.
And time for a look at the five-day forecast, really shaping up to be a nice long weekend right across the province. Looking at the overnight lows and conditions, you can see cloud cover for most of BC and Cranbrook. It's only a 30% chance of those flurries, but otherwise we've got this high pressure system that's in place from north to south. That's going to continue into early next week. And then you can see Tuesday, it starts to break down through the north central coast as that next system moves south. That's when we'll likely see a return of the rain, at least in coastal sections. But until then, enjoy those blue skies. We did have some high cloud cover, at least in Vancouver and around the south coast for most of today. And we might see that again tomorrow, but largely in the northern parts of the province. And we do have a strong wind warning in effect for uh, northern BC, right near the northern border. So that'll likely be tomorrow night. 80 kil kilometer an hour winds is being what's uh, forecast from Environment Canada. Otherwise, here's the five-day forecast for Metro Vancouver. As we said, lots of sunshine, even reaching those mid-teens come uh, Easter Monday. So enjoy those conditions while they last through the long weekend because those uh, clouds and the unstable air mass with some of that rain will re likely return midweek. And that is your late news for this Saturday, March 30th. For news anytime, anywhere, download the free CBC News app. You can always find us online at cbc.ca slash bc. Thanks for watching this long weekend. Good night.